but as he said in his introductory remarks, this is more of a, a general sort of talk or discussion on what constitutes food security and why, at least uh, I do and many people would share that opinion, I think, all across India, as to why food security is a very critical issue for us in India. Uh, looking to uh, really have a kickstart uh, towards a more developed economy. So what do we actually mean by food security? There is, there is an international definition by the Agriculture and Food Association, the FAO of the United Nations, which says that when they talk about food security, they mean economic and physical access to all people at all times to enough food to live a healthy life. So this is the broad framework in which uh, the FAO has defined food security. As an Indian citizen, and having uh, uh, living in a country which has suffered a history of dependence on the provision of food, I think we need to slightly expand the definition of the FAO to also include components which require the issue of food security to be looked at also as an issue of national sovereignty. So therefore, in my view, there are two aspects to policies regarding food security. One is food security is a component of national sovereignty and food security as a component for human well-being. Now, just very briefly, coming to the first aspect, you know, all of, none of you were born at that time, except for maybe some of the faculty, perhaps not even all of them. But, you know, like in the 60s, um, there was a very severe drought in India. And following independence where we were, you know, shopping around for getting food aid from different countries, we came to an agreement with the United States of America, which was called the PL480 Agreement, the PL480 Agreement. And that agreement uh, allocated a certain amount of funds from the United States budgetary allocations to give food aid to India. And at that time, we took that aid because we believed that we had no uh, choice but to take that aid. And that became a most notorious example, one of the first examples, of course there were many others, but today it's not my topic, but as to how the lack of self-sufficiency impacts on national sovereignty. But a critical Commodity like food, when you are dependent for food, when you are dependent on a commodity on which the people's survival depends, then the vulnerability becomes obviously all the more, um, you know, all the more. And therefore, what we started to see, how this issue of food security, or the lack of food security, and the dependence on food aid became a lever which the United States was trying to influence our policy. For example, at that time there was the Vietnam War and uh, the government of India was taking various positions um, in tune with the United Nations against US intervention in Vietnam. And then there was that famous quotation by the then President of the United States uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, the notorious Lyndon B. Johnson. There was a slogan at that time against the war, um, LBJ, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? That was a kind of atmosphere at that time when he was president about the Vietnam War. But what he said was, 
People told him that, you know, the Pope is taking the same stand as India. The United Nations is taking the same stand as India. So why are you turning on India? And he said, well, we are not providing wheat added to the Pope or to the United Nations. So that was the message. Therefore, the point that I want to make is food security is very much linked to food self-sufficiency of any country, and particularly a country like India, which has such a large population. So therefore, to come back to my first point, the definition of food security, we should enlarge it to look at policies which either strengthen self-sufficiency or weaken self-sufficiency in the context of providing welfare to the people. Now, in this, what has been our record? As far as development of production, because it's not just a question of handouts to people. To provide food security, you have to produce. So you have to produce the minimum amount of food grains, what are the kind of grain that our people eat. You have to produce wheat, you have to produce rice. If you want to add a component of protein, which you should, you have to produce pulses. The cheapest used to be the cheapest, now the most expensive protein, etc. So, in that, India has done quite well. Of course, today we have many critiques about the development of the Green Revolution and the cost, um, as far as the use of fertilizers are concerned, the pollution of the groundwater levels. Etc. So, there are many controversial questions and many questions they do the pattern of development of agriculture production in India, but I do think at the end of it, we do have those problems, but at that point, did we really have an alternative when the issue of self-sufficiency was so important? And I think, regardless, and I do have many um, you know, issues with that pattern of development, but I think standing back and looking at it, at that time, it was critical for India to become very quickly self-sufficient in food grains. Our foreign exchange levels were also very low at that time. And therefore, this pattern, it was a skewered pattern, but anyway, it drove us and helped us to become more or less self-sufficient in food grains. Now, but one aspect of that development was, since it was driven by the state, and since it was driven by state policy, it was not an even development all across India. It was a development where the money went is where the development of agriculture production took place. And therefore, you have a situation in India that you have the best natural irrigation in the east of India. I mean, for example, if you look at Bengal, if you look at Orissa, if you look at Jharkhand, some of those areas which are rain-fed areas they used to be, where the groundwater level was really high and it was extremely fertile ground. But the money from this government went towards Punjab and Haryana to the northern part of India. And therefore, although you did have a situation where the possibility of making a much larger number of states, food surplus states, or food self-sufficient states, your entire investment went into certain states in the northern Belgium. That was also very limited. But then Punjab and Haryana and Western UP and many of those areas, some strip of Madhya Pradesh, became the granary of India in that sense. Although, in, as far as nature was concerned, there was nothing negative about putting that same money so therefore, with the resources you had, you decided to go for that part of development. As a result of which, today in India, you have surplus states, you have deficit states, you have states which really desperately need aid, you have the entire northeast region in India, where transport is also so poor, conveyance is so poor, and the need for uh, sending food grain is so high, that the cost of feeding northeast is much higher than maybe in other parts of India. So while we can say that we did become self-sufficient as a nation, as a country, because of policies in the 70s and 80s, 60s, 70s and 80s, at the same time, it was 
a part of uneven development as far as self-sufficiency is concerned with large parts of India, both without central investment and also without the investment in infrastructure. So you have vast swaths of India where you, you can procure food rates from the farmers, but your storage is so poor. So where are you going to store them? the grains? So therefore you have this scandal of rotten food grains. We have people starving and you know the famous statement about you know the rats are getting fed but our people are hungry. So this is precisely linked to this aspect of where the investment went. The central government did not invest in many parts of India. It chose to invest in the states which they thought would be politically more beneficial to them. So that's one aspect of the policy I wanted to flag. The third aspect that I just want to uh, mention here is that even today, I mean, I think it's the first time last year when uh, the rate of food grain growth went below uh, population. So we are coming to a sort of a, a, a situation where the stagnation of food production is going to be a problem. There is also another aspect here which I want to draw attention to. There is a set of opinion that we are living in a globalized world, we are living in a world of, you know, at the press of a button, you can, you know, order so many thousand tons or million metric tons of grain from Australia or from America or from Canada and you can just get it over so easily by these very well developed containers, literally silos moving on the, on, on the sea. So why should you produce yourself? Why should you need production when there are so many problems linked to that production? So there is a strong opinion which is backed very strongly by major agribusiness companies like Monsanto in the world who are pushing this aspect that you don't need self-sufficiency anymore because you live in a globalized world where markets are free, where import is free, all you've got to do guys is to pay the global market price and of course the global market price is going to be determined by how many takers there are. So basically this is an area of contestation even in India because I remember when I was in Parliament, it was in 2006 or 2007, I'm not absolutely sure about the year, and we were horrified to see that whereas our ration shops and our public distribution system were shrinking, India was exporting huge amounts of food grains. India did, first of all, India did not procure from its own farmers. India allowed big agribusinesses to procure from our farmers by giving them maybe a 50 rupee bonus over and above the minimum support price that we were giving. You know, there's something called MSP. That's the minimum support price that we give to our farmers, which is actually linked to cost of production plus profit. I mean, MS Swaminathan, uh, the most well-known uh, specialist expert who also drove the Green Revolution, made a calculation saying MSP should be cost of production plus 50% profit if you want to make agriculture viable. But of course, <laughs> nobody accepted that. But anyway, so uh, you had a situation there. And there was a discussion in Parliament and Mr. Sharad Babar, uh, and I, I don't need to make this you know, personality based or individual based, but you know, it is important for me to identify people who were there in uh, important positions of power who were driving these policies. And they argued exactly what I said. What's wrong in exporting and what's wrong in importing? Now, what was wrong with it? I'll tell you what was wrong with it. First of all, you did not procure. And when you do not, when I say you, I mean the government of India. So the government of India did not procure. The government of India let agri businesses procure. They procured at slightly higher prices for the farmers to some extent benefited slightly, one section of farmers. Then they hoarded the stocks. And then, since you had not procured, your public distribution.
distribution system started shrinking. You had also made sure that it shrunk. So what you did not give your farmers, you exported back from the very companies who bought it your farm, from your farmers, and you bought that very food grade from them, produced in Punjab, produced in Haryana, but at much higher prices. So this set of policies, which hits at self-sufficiency, which makes fun of the slogan of self-reliance by saying, Ali Gito Nehru ka slogan tha, this is an old socialist slogan, it's got nothing to do with the liberalized world and globalized world. They are talking a whole lot of, well, you can understand. But it is exactly that, worth nothing. In fact, I think excreta today is worth much more because of the new technologies of human excreta for organic farming. So, in any case, so that really was what it was worth. So, that is one ideological framework which is there as far as food security is concerned. The second aspect is, you cannot have food securities on the back of distressed farmers. It's, it can't go together. So if, as I believe, you do need self-sufficiency, you cannot do it by breaking the back of farmers. You have to look and see why are farmers committing suicide. What is the extent of distress? What is the extent of debt? Why is this happening? And that is very much to do. Now, this also is a new framework. Minimum government, maximum governance. I mean, what does that mean? Do any of you know what it means? I mean, we're all bright legal students. If you go to the definition of when it becomes government and when it becomes governance, well, in my experience, it's always government when you've got a cut from the resources of the nation when you're giving it to the poor. So you've got to cut back on that, cut back on subsidies, cut back on MSP, cut back on subsidies to farm or fertilizer, cut back on everything. Then it's government, so it's minimum government. But when you're giving tax concessions, when you're dealing with huge NPAs, when you're dealing with huge problems of, you know, legal cases in the Supreme Court, which as a finance minister said, I mean, this is going to affect the investment in the future, so give it all up. Take the decision that you're going to wave off retrospective, match with retrospective effect. When you're going to wave off we all go to phones, huge tax arrears because they calculate it wrongly. We wave it off, well, that's governance. So that's maximum governance. So when it comes to the rich, it's governance. When it comes to the poor, it's government. So what you're having now is, and you have to look at it in an ideological way, because you're, you're going to the legal world. But if you divorce that legal world from social realities, or from the policies which frame laws to look in a particular way, then I think you're not going to be doing justice. I'm sure you have an oath too, like the... Do lawyers have an oath? Like doctors have the Hippocratic oath, you have one. You do? Well, I don't know where it is. I haven't seen it inscribed in any of the courts, but I guess it's in our hearts. <laughs> I, I think it's in our hearts, or it should be in our hearts. But anyway, so the point that I was making is about farmers. Now, what has the Modi government done? Now, look, I'm not here to discuss political parties or, you know, my party versus that. You know, no, I belong to the CPIM. But I'm not here to discuss my party versus APOC. But I'm just going to give you facts. So what has the Modi government done? And I want to give you these facts as far as farmers are concerned, because I think if, if I can find that particular paper which I wrote it on, which unfortunately I have left behind in my book. So, you know, that is typical of someone of my age. You bring the wrong book along. Now let me just see. I had a very interesting, um, 
chart and a figure which I was working on, which shows the percentage of increase of um, during the Modi government as far as MSP is concerned. Well, here we have it. So, I'll just quickly read it out to you without being too boring. As far as Paddy or Rice is concerned, Paddy, in 2012-13, the increase in MSP was 15.3% over the last year. That's a substantial increase. The next step came down to 5%. The next step came down to 4%. That's when Modi came in, 14 to 15, and came down to 4%. And this year, under Mr. Jaitley's stewardship of the finance ministry, it's come down to 3.6%. So from a high of 15, an average of 5, it's now come down to 3.6%. That's as far as rice is concerned. And if you look at wheat, it's the same story. That the increase was 9.8%, came down to 5.1%. Then during, after uh, the NDA took over, it's 37 This year it's 36 And this is a period, uh, but 36 increase is a joke. Because when you look at the inputs and when you look at the cost of production as calculated by Professor Swap, it's far higher. It's around 10 to 12. So you're not even making, forget the plus profit. In fact, with these low margins of uh, percentage increase, percentage point increases, uh, you're basically telling the farmers, you know, we're not here to help you. So, this aspect is a very critical area of food production. Although this year we have, um, although our production has come down substantially by about 50 million tons compared to last year, our procurement remains the same. Now you can say, well, that's very good compared to what Mr. Shah did in 2006, 2007. These procurement has remained the same. But what are the facts behind it? It's because global prices have crashed. It's because Monsanto is getting cheap grain everywhere. They don't want grain right now. They have enough grain. They don't have markets to offer the grains right now. So big agri businesses are waiting for some huge natural disaster um, to occur in some parts of the world, or huge hoarding, which is then going to push global prices up. Even petrol prices are down. So they're not seeing a glimmer of hope anywhere. So they're not buying from Indian farmers. And because they're not buying from Indian farmers, Indian farmers are suffering this much because the government of India, who should do the maximum it can to help relieve the distress that Indian farmers are in, has decided no go. So that's one aspect of food security which we are suffering today. The second is that in India, we have one of the best infrastructures to provide essential commodities to our people. It's one of the best in the world. We have something like 5.2 lakh fair price shops, including in really remote areas of India. Now, when we talk about developed infrastructure, what do we think of? We think of the super outer ring road which you are on. I think it's one of the best drives I've ever had from the airport. I mean, it's great. And we think of all the fantastic highways in Delhi and the freeways and we think, wow, we're getting there. I mean, what's the difference of driving from Hyderabad's GMR airport to NASA and driving from, say, Los Angeles airport to you know, a, a university just outside Los Angeles. It's all happening there. So this is how we look at infrastructure. And sure, that is infrastructure. It's very important how we get around. But what about infrastructure, which also serves a social purpose? What about that? Is that important? But how much we set up Yojana for ground for the villages? That's very important. Funds are being cut. Fair price shops today, which is one of India's great achievements. What all my criticisms of previous government
Southern Street we, we built a fair price system network. No other third world country, developing country, even approximates what we did. What is happening today? Today, Rajasthan, not of Dalit Modi fame, but certainly of the Sundara Raji fame. So today, Rajasthan has got a new model which is being promoted by the central government, which is to provide shelf space in fair price shops to big retailers like Reliance, Tata's, Fortune and Company, etc. So this is a new PPP model. So a fair price shop where you're going to be getting grains also becomes a shop for all kinds of products. Now, frankly, why shouldn't it be if we can get products at reasonable prices to a much larger market? I don't think there's any harm in it. But what is the harm? The harm is going to be that Within 10 years, I can give you, I mean, I can, I, I can bet you on this. Because this is how PPP works. This is how it's working with model schools, which used to be with the government. They're all private now. It's going to be the beginning of a privatization process. So that is started. So the infrastructure we require of fair price shops, that also is going to be a problem in the future. I wanted to flag that for you. In India, we used to have what is called a universal public distribution system. Everybody has access to grains and the ration shop. Around the 1990s, when this whole new economic framework started, this became screened out to become a targeted system. Uh, please remember this word, target. Okay, now, when you go into a village, say in Adivasi, India, or, I mean, I would say three-fourths of the villages in, in India, it would be easier for you to target who is rich than for you to target who is poor. But our targeted system decided that they would have to work out a better to decide who is poor. Now, the country which has 30% of the most hungry people in the whole world. What do you think of that? 30% of the people suffering from hunger in the whole world is India. There's something called the Global Hunger Index. I don't know if you've heard of it. Okay, it's the global, there's a methodology which the UN uses. There are not 120 countries which they say are really bad as far as hunger is concerned. We are 55. Thank God we're above, uh, I think, uh, uh, some of the poorest countries in Africa. That's about it. I think we're living better than Pakistan. I think that would make many people in Delhi very happy. <laughs> But what I mean is, I don't think that's much of a benchmark for most of us. In a country like that, why should you start targeting the poor? All over the world it's been found that the rich exclude themselves. There's a process of self-exclusion. And it's worked. Now, Tamil Nadu, starting from MGR's time, they believed that food was critical for Tamil Nadu's development. And Tamil Nadu used its resources from industry to invest in health and food. And it was one of the most successful food programs. The infant mortality rates, the anemic rates for women, the underweight percentage of children dropped dramatically because food was available without exception. And that 20, 30 year old experience of Tamil Nadu followed that of Canada. In Canada, what we have in Canada is a system of ration shops which is backed up by a system of fair price shops. They're called Marbury. I don't know if there are any students here from Canada. So these Marbury stores are stores which the government buys products and at a no profit, no loss, sells products 
in stores which are situated next to the Russian shops, not like the Dakistan model, where they're handing it over to the big retailers, but the Kerala model, where the government itself buys and gives those commodities everything, so oil, salt, powder, cream, whatever, even cloth, at no profit, no loss, which usually works out to one third the market price. So you have this combination in Kerala which worked very successfully, and therefore Kerala also is one of the most food secure states, not because it produces the food grain, but because of its distribution system. So along comes the World Bank, and along comes the IMF which says, you guys in India don't know what the hell you're doing. This is no use. You're spending your money wrongly. So what you should be doing is spending your money in building SEZs, spending your money in developing all these enclaves, and as far as food subsidy is concerned, cut down on food subsidy. Food subsidy is a no-no. Fertilizer subsidy to farmers is a no-no. You've got to now target. Otherwise, there's too much leakage. Now, listen, it's just, I mean, you don't need to be a rocket scientist. Just common sense. If out of 100 people, 80 people are poor, you're going to spend more money and more identification problems, and you're going to have more leakages. If out of that 80 who are poor, or who are deprived in one way or another, you're going to say, who's poor? Who's very poor? Who's very, very poor? Who's eating one roti a day? Who's eating two rotis a day? Who's not eating at all? Now you may think, you know, I'm making light of it. This is a fact. If you look at the outrageous criteria, not just in the 1990s, right now, have you heard of the SECC? The Social Economic Class Census. Have any of you heard of it? Okay, so this was started in 2011. You cannot imagine what this thing is. They have an exclusion criteria. Some are to be excluded. And in that exclusion, a person who has a four-wheeler is equated with a person who has a two-wheeler. Now, in your mind, would you equate a person who's riding on a scooter, who may have taken a loan for the scooter, and a person who's using an SUV, would you equate them in your mind? No, you wouldn't, would you? Would you say a person who has a dacha house with one room is very much different from a person who has a dacha house with two rooms? Is there a great difference? But it's it's, it's a question of life and death for so many of our people. If you have a dacha house with two rooms, you don't get a mark on a BPL score. Now, if you have a son, if you're a widow, and you have a son who's about 18 years old, you don't score a mark for being a single woman. Because it's assumed in patriarchal India, with apologies to all the sons here, I'm sure you're all going to look after your mothers, but I'm just saying it's a patriarchal notion that you have, if you have a son who's over 18 years old, he's going to look after you, he's going to earn money regardless of the unemployment rates in India, and therefore you don't get a mark of being a single woman. If you have a disabled child, and one earning member in the family, you don't get the score of having a disabled child. Now, these sort of absolutely socially outrageous and cruel markers are what decides who gets food security benefits in India. If there is a scandal, if there is a scam, it is the way corporate India has cornered for itself all its resources, represented by a government, 
which does not give a damn, excuse me for using these words, for any of this rationality. I mean, it's irrational. Now, after a huge lot of argument, debate, street struggle, street fights, everything, everything, you have got a food security law passed in 2030, okay? After all the debate and everything. The basic understanding for food security law should have been that India has the wherewithal to have a universal system. Exclude income tax payers. Okay? Definitely exclude income tax payers. They're not going to go to ration shops and get cheap ration. They, they don't even need rice or wheat at all. They may all be on really good diets, which are carbohydrate-free diets. So that's okay. That's each person has its own agenda. That's fine. So they're not going to be, you know, using the ration card. They're going to be self-excluding themselves. So exclude certain easily identifiable categories, government employees who got six pay commission. Exclude them, who are in regular jobs. Definitely, you can identify, they're easily identifiable. So you can identify them without any leakage or without much scope for corruption. So identify them, exclude them. If they make up, you know, 10% of India or 15% of India, that's fine. But what about the rest? But this food security brought in by the UK government was highly inadequate. It gave only 5 kgs per person. Today I'm getting 35 kilos and in the name of food security, it's reduced to the number of people in my family, although the government can certainly give it as enough food grains to give 35 kilos. Today, for the last 5 years, we have buffer stocks, which are double the buffer stock now. Double the buffer stock. Right now in India, we have approximately 4.9 crore metric tons. That's around 490 million metric tons of food grains. What do we need for a universal system? We need about 60 lakh tons. Uh, I beg your pardon. We need 60 million tons a year. So you have 600, you have 500, but you need 60 million tons. So these are estimates by economists in the planning commission when they were looking at alternatives to the result come out of my head. So there was nothing to prevent it. Today India's expenditure on GDP for food is around 1% of entire GDP. India's expenditure on food subsidies is around 1%. Now it looks huge. It's 90,000 crore rupees a year. You look at that figure and say, wow, is that what we're spending on food? You say, no, not the subsidy. But what's the size of the cake? This is just around 1% of it. So you don't look at the whole. You look at the whole, then you have to say, okay, that's too much for you. But every year you are giving 5 lakh crore rupees in tax concessions to corporate India. 5 lakh crores. You are spending 1 lakh crore for a universal PDS which you don't want. So I am saying these arguments are bogus. If you have the political will, you want to feed the poor, India has the resources to do so. So what happened? We brought the Food Security Act, which according to me is totally inadequate, but we got it. That was important because you need a legal backing to everything you do. So you got a legal backing, and that was a big step forward, although it was a, I would say, it could have been much better. Now what happens? Government goes, it didn't get the benefit of the Food Security Act, which is why I brought it in the first place. We have a new government. Now what does this government do? 
These are the steps. I'm not going to comment on it. I'm just going to give you the steps. First step, it issued a circular to all the states. Don't give bonus to farmers. So states which felt that from their own resources, if the central government was increasing only by 3%, and the states from their own resources wanted to give a bonus MSP to the farmer, the central government said, don't do it. If you do it, we are not going to procure from your farmers. At a time when they knew the farmers didn't have a market to sell because global prices had crashed. So instead of, so I'm not going to say instead of standing by farmers because that's a comment, I'm just giving you the fact. The first point was no bonus to farmers. Done. The second point was it issued circulars which made implementation of the Food Security Act of 2030 conditional. What were the conditions? Ensure doorstep delivery. You get what that means. At present, fair price dealers go to the FCI go down, collect the food grains for that rational shop from there. Okay? And then people come to the rational shop to buy. Now guess what this government says? If you don't ensure doorstep delivery, we are not going to allow you to implement the system. Where's the money for doorstep delivery? And even if you assume the doorstep delivery is from the state government, from the FCI go down to the rational shop and then he charges for it, how is it ever going to happen? So doorstep delivery. The third is that there is a category called Anto Dayana country, started by Vajpayee So those, that's about 2.5 crore families. That's about maybe 12 crore people in India. So that's the poor, very poor, very, very poor. So they get cheaper rates, 2 rupees, instead of 3 rupees, or instead of 5 rupees, or instead of 8 rupees. Okay? So they benefit. What does this government do? It says, freeze AOI. If somebody dies, somebody becomes rich, somebody becomes poor, we don't care. No additions to AOI, even if your survey showed that a larger number of people are now part, according to your own bogus criteria, are now part of the under-death criteria. So that's it. So if people drop out or they die or whatever happens to them or they shift out of their villages because they are migrating, those AY cards, under their cards, are scrapped forever. This is not their they act. They act guarantees under there. The fourth thing they did was 2011 census population figures are valid for the next 10 years. So, look, I mean, if I have a child, or if I was pregnant in 2011, when my kid is four or five, I definitely need food grains for the child. But, no, if I get married, if I'm a young person, I get married, I have a nuclear family, no. So, 2011, that population figures frozen for the next 10 years. This was never there in the Food Security Act. As a result of all these conditions, no prices for guessing what's happened to the Food Security Act. After what is it, 36 states and union territories now, or 30, 33, 31, or a large figure, just dropping out two or three states, and that's probably actually been a bigger. They have not been able to fully implement the law. 13 states only have partially implemented it district-wise. And the vast majority of India's poor are without the benefit of an act 
which was unanimously passed by Parliament in 2013. How does it happen? It's happened because overtaking the law, bypassing the law, subordinating the law to an outlook which says no more subsidies. Many of us who come from the middle classes, we have an anathema to subsidies. Because we feel that leakages is going to the wrong people, there's a whole lot of corruption, and it's no good, do better targeting. Now, these are oxymorons. Because the large number of people require that subsidy. Look at the figures, link the two things of malnutrition and subsidy. So, Subsidy is not a bad thing because when people are not hungry, even if you look at it from a different point of view, not from a social point of view, don't look at people's hunger, don't look at that woman who's having to work eight hours a day with one meal. Forget about her, don't bother about her. Look at India's growth rates and development. I'm saying even if you look at that, even if you wear spectacles like I'm doing, which doesn't look at one side, it looks at the other. Look at it. Less hungry people, will they or will they not be more productive for you? Will a person who is healthy, who's eaten enough, be a better skilled worker for you? Can you skill India on the back of hungry people? That's what I ask. India is not just, you know, some of us. And our numbers are growing and that's great because we have access to education. But that's not what India is all about. There is another India. And if you really talk about India and we want to skill it, I want to skill, I'm working with tribals. I want to skill tribal youth. And then when I think about it, I just, you know, I, I just don't know how any of us can stay sane. I went to a village in Maharashtra, Kane district. There's this boy who's completed class 10, a very bright boy. He wants to do class 11 and 12. He can't because, you know, the land is there, it's being now reserved, there's going to be a reserved forest area there. These guys are waiting to get 10 lakh rupees as compensation. There's a huge family. What are they going to do with 10 lakhs? Nobody knows. This boy went out. He came to my meeting, he said, I've come here only to tell you what I'm doing. I'm not, I'm, I'm not hearing about what you want to do. I said, sure, go ahead. He said, he's working with the sand mafia. Okay? A lot of the Adivasi boys, they get picked up by sand contractors. So they do, just go out of Bombay. They have these boats and they have buckets. So these boys have to dive deep down into the ocean bed. The bucket is taken out there, it's a weighted bucket. When they get there, they take the bricks and stones out of the bucket. Right there underwater, they have to fill up the bucket and then they give a tap. The bucket comes up. If they're lucky, they come up too. He told me four people from his village and surrounding villages, there are four missing boys, not from his crew, but there are four missing boys. They're gone, they're finished. Now I ask you, I don't we want that boy to be skilled? But that boy is working because the ration shop in his village is not giving food grains. Therefore, a large part of his family's income. One of the indicators of development in the world is how much does a family spend on its food? Ideally, if a family's food expenditure is less than around 30%, you're considered a developed family. In the more developed countries, it's much less. In India, it's socially structured. An Adivasi, a Dalit, a poor Muslim, or somebody who's an agricultural worker family, they tend to spend much more of their income on food. Therefore, any government which wants to provide skill to its people has to ensure that whatever income they have Less and less amount is spent on food. We can't control prices. We're not able to do that. 
But can't we at least get the basics of food to the process? That's the question before us today when we talk about food security. I am for skill development. I am for doing whatever we can to gain a demographic dividend for India. But what are the demographics? That's the question. And our demographics are quite frankly that a huge section of India are hungry and they would be skilled if we could ensure that we could fill out the best of us. So basically, right now the situation is that the Food Security Act, for which we fought so hard and so long, is, in, uh, is being sabotaged step by step. Something like the Land Acquisition Act, which will be in all the follow. So here was this act which was passed unanimously by Parliament. And then here comes this government and says, no, no corporates are going to put in for industry here because for God's sake, they're going to have to pay the farmer, you know, for land which should be easily available. And therefore, they took away the right of consent to farmers and they brought an ordinance. But as it happens, the Indian farmers fought back and they got their hearing in Parliament too. And fortunately, or some would say unfortunately, the Rajya Sabha still doesn't have a bulldozer majority and therefore there was a debate and the government felt it wiser to cut their losses and they withdrew the ordinance and today we have a situation where we're back with 2013 having lost three sessions of parliament. But it's great that they had to step back because nobody would have benefited. You can have a majority in parliament but if you don't have a majority with the farmers you're going to have a lot of trouble with that. The really are. So what's happening in Chatham? I mean, we all want mining of our minerals, but when you bulldoze tribal rights, you're going to have problems. How many people are going to put in jail? I mean, let's face it. It's not going to be that easy. You have a, you have a good law. Yeah, I'm through. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally through right now. Yeah, um, I don't know. Because I have to go to that village there. So. But yeah. So I'm going to wind up now to say that let's hope what happens with the, what happened with the land ordinance uh, in a different way what happened with the Food Security Act and the present sabotage which is taking place, we can reverse it uh, and do something good for those who, uh, majority of Indians, who would be happier if they had the benefits of food security. So thank you very much. One was in Pondicherry, one was in Rajasthan. 
and uh, there was one in Bihar also, because Indishti was one of the strongest proponents for cash transfers. And those pilots have shown that it doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is, one, the whole issue of bank accounts, with India's banking system as poor as it is, they have to do it through business corresponding order. I don't think we have enough time to go into all that. But whereas you are right in saying that uh, transportation costs as far as the government uh, will be stopped, it doesn't mean the transportation costs for the beneficiary will be less. In fact, it will be more on the family. They have to make multiple trips to the bank, which is not necessary in their village. They have to make multiple trips to ensure that the business correspondent is available. They have to make multiple trips because you find one shop selling it at one particular rate and another shop selling it at another particular rate. So basically the cash transfer system where there is such huge transactions of 80 crore persons, 80 crore, is not going to work. And especially with the volatile market and crisis, the government is not going to increase your subsidy every week according to the market price. So basically you're going to lose out. So for the government, yes, you're right. But for a person who's supposed to be the beneficiary, it's, it's, uh, it'll be negative. Okay, so in the interest of time, we'll just collect questions, but please ask pointed questions. That was very pointed, actually. Yeah, important. <laughs> Yeah. 
left out, then you catch up. Then catch up as fast as you can syndrome, which the central government with its powers put their more in, made it a struggle. However, in spite of that, I, I would say that Bengal was one of the best PDS systems. Definitely not. There were many problems with it, primarily because it was the rice mill traders who were actually directly procuring. It is only in the last 10 years of the Nefran rule when we started direct procurement from the farmers, which made a big difference. So if we have another 10 years, we'll definitely uh, much more improve the system. But I can tell you, given the circumstances and the resources, we did not a bad job compared to many of the other states. But I won't say it was perfect. Okay, last question, Adil. Uh, so thank you for uh, the talk. Uh, the question is, uh, my, uh, my question is, uh, when you started with this premise, uh, okay, then, then you started with this point that uh, the, the beneficiaries of green uh, renovation uh, were in the uh, in the other Indian states, because there were, uh, there were certain political interests involved uh, that, uh, that's why uh, perhaps uh, certain eastern and northeastern states uh, did not uh, one of the prime beneficiaries of green renovation. Uh, I can understand the north, north, northeastern states, why they would not be Bihar, the combined Bihar. I mean, there, uh, there were enough number of uh, Lok Sabha seats. It was also sending leaders to, uh, to the cabinet and. See, uh, and interrupt, Chair. I, I don't want to make too big a political issue of this, okay? Because uh, that goes into a different debate. I just want to come back to say you can find your own reasons why this happened. But let's agree on this fact that the central government invested in certain areas of India for whatever reasons, which it found convenient at the time. And as a result of that, you may call it discrimination or you may call it decision making, or you know, that is left to you to, to find your own reasons why that happened. But the result of that was that a whole part of India developed as far as food self sufficiency is concerned because of central government investment and a whole other part of India did not. So uh, I, I think I leave it at that. Okay. Is that okay with you? There's a reason why we're calling it a policy lecture series, right? So uh, I'd like to once again thank Ms. Nuta Karat for taking out the time and visiting us. Uh, Getting guest speakers to Nasa is also a task.